Uh, some of the stuff I'll talk about is kind of we, will be kind of generic. Some of it's very specific to the tools that that I built for my development work. And uh, one of the things you end up doing if you if you're good at what you do is build tools to help you build tools. Okay. Uh, I do that in my day job, you know, much to an annoyance sometimes of my coworkers, but then to the great delight of my coworkers sometimes. <laughs> okay, and uh, I know Evans done some great tool development. He showed at Cocoa Fest, uh, venture game tools and stuff. But uh, as an introduction, I'm John Strong. I have one of the few color computer game programmers who is still a color computer game programmer. <laughs> from back in the day. Uh, Claim the fame, uh, I had a couple games reviewed but in Rainbow Magazine, which was the big magazine for the 10 day color computer. Uh, been associated with Rainbow Fest and Cocoa Fest for a large number of years, numerous seminars and, and so on both. Uh, since we are a multi-platform kind of group, I'll give you some of the reasons I, we originally chose the, the color computer. And part of those is some of the reasons Evans talked about is one of the 6809 processor. When we got our first personal computer that we bought, okay, that I didn't build, uh, it, you had a, a very limited market. You know, VIC-20 was like a major machine at that time, it gives you time. Uh, you know, TI-99-4. Uh, 10D color computer and a lot of stuff that had just black and white very crude graphics and, and one of the things we wanted to do and I say we because uh, my brother and myself uh, did a lot of this together he was my partner in Strongware and uh, lost him to uh, lithoma several years ago but we did this as a partnership and uh, I did the development he did kind of the selling at the shows and stuff and uh, we wanted to do some of our own games. We thought that would be cool. And so I kind of did a lot of research and okay, what can we do? What machine is going to allow us the access to actually develop a good game? And so a lot of them made it very hard to get to it. TI 99 <laughs> for one, uh, to get to stuff as a, somebody without a lot of money to be able to develop for. And, and to use it for resources of the machine. And uh, during my research, I came across the 6809, the fact that you know, it could be run on a multitask operating system. It was designed to be programmed uh, very logically uh, instruction set. And so that kind of became my source. Plus the fact you could get them to the Radio Shack and they were everywhere at the time. And so, we started out originally with a 4K uh, color computer one, and through the years that grew in size to uh, a 512K system. We started out with cassette uh, with you know floppy drives and such, and peripherals and so on. And so it was basically the power of the processor. I, when new going in, in some cases, the video on the others especially after we got with available Ataris and the Commodore 64. Might have been easier to do some of the games with that, but still we had a much more powerful processing system uh, in the processor. And, you know, I, I hit every seminar and stuff I could at Rainbow Fest and, and so on. And by the time before the Rainbow Fest, I'd actually stopped it run of that, uh, I had a commercial game going out there. And really, it didn't intend to go into doing what I would call clone games, but it just kind of way, way to happen. <laughs> uh, the first game that was commercial, it was actually uh, My Soviet Block, which is a treacherous version. And I didn't write that intending to be a commercial game to start out with. I decided I was a, uh, I got a big family. and. Uh, another brother's house and he had a Game Boy and I do Tetris but they had it on there they really hadn't played it. I played it a little bit. So, oh well I could write that. Oh well you know my brother would love a video game custom rope for him for Christmas. Well that's what I did. 
And uh, prototyped it in BASIC. BASIC is good for prototyping a lot of things. It's just uh, you don't have enough speed to do certain things you know, on an 8-bit processor. And uh, so that became a Soviet block. Uh, Gems is a column type game. Copycat is actually in BASIC. <laughs> Since we're using Palette switching, to do most of the action, so we don't need anything really fast acting there. And so that's set. Um, most recent game, give you guys some background where I'm coming from, is actually Bomb Squad. It's a Minesweeper type game. Uh, most of my games have some kind of little hook, something spatial that's in them. In the uh, Soviet bloc, it actually has stereo sound effects if you use the orchestra dining card. Uh, same thing in gems. Copycat, you could actually use with a uh, light pin and play it. Okay, Never did mark it one separately, but uh, that was one of the catches in it. The Tindy Color Computer for joysticks uses analog joystick. And nominally, it's supposed to be able to read from 0 to 63. Well, some of our hacker groups in the, the color computer, uh, John Kowalski, uh, Nick Morantes, and Robert Goff, got together and worked on an idea that, that John Kowalski had, our sock master, as we, he's often called uh, online, that he could get a lot more resolution out of, the, out of that joystick. And they worked out a way, software routine, and lo and behold, we can now get 640 resolution instead of 63, uh, and possibly more, okay? So a 10x increase over what the nominal hardware factors are. Well, some time ago I had did a Minesweeper just to test some of my tool sets out. And I'm like, okay, well, the market doesn't really need another Minesweeper and other stuff out there. But now, okay, I have something that we can use full high res on. Hmm. So I redid my graphics and uh, put a little kind of police bomb defusing scheme to Minesweeper and create a cartridge to use as the hybrid joystick routine. So that's a little catch on it. And so our first gentleman to talk mentions something about character graphics and creating things. And actually in a lot of the, the game era, consoles and stuff used a basically character type graphics, but it was what we would call a tile map. The hardware would take a bitmap pattern in a certain memory place and map it on the screen for you. And so this is actually uh, my tool that I do my mapping with and to create some of my graphics and stuff with things. And uh, so here we can see uh, a game I've been working on. These are different tiles. Basic a tile is your character. And we go over here, we can see that now I've took this and created a map. Now I have a background image created out of those items. And if we go through these, we can see different pieces and things that I have put together on, on a game that I currently have some development on. And And here I just did one to show kind of the, the whole building. And so you can move through it so we have this. And some time ago, uh, on the forums and stuff, people, when the record album movie came out, people said, well, why don't somebody do the Fix It Felix game for it? And I looked, well, it looks doable. I don't know if I want to do it, but it's definitely something that could be done on the Tinny Color computer. And, and it kind of has that unique hook on it that, I, that attacks my attention. This fact it is something that's never really existed on an 8-bit machine. Uh, even though the movie says it, you know, 30 years ago it happened and it's there, and it'd been on a Donkey Kong era hardware, nobody's actually implemented it on that hardware. Uh, there's been Sega Genesis versions, been a 2600 
version that's solo, whereas it's really not the same game. And uh, so over time, I've, I've looked at it and actually made a decision, yeah, I think I'm going to do this. And uh, so this is some of my maps to do this and tools to do that. But in game making, there's some key things you have to do. You know, today we have all these games with the Xbox and the PlayStation 4s, and, and you know, graphics is fantastic. But if your, your Twitch skills is not fast, you know, some of those, if you're not in the first person shooters, sometimes there's not a lot of games out there now. <laughs> it's really interesting, just fun to play. And sometimes they have forgotten the essential part of the game, and that's gameplay. Okay, Pac-Man. Is graphics that great in Pac-Man? No. Gameplay great. Is graphics that great on Tetris? No. Gameplay. Gameplay is your key. If you don't have gameplay, forget the game. I don't care how fancy or pretty it looks. If it doesn't have good gameplay, forget the game. So the first thing in your game development is, is it going to have good gameplay? I mean, it's cool to show up great new hardware, do a little, you know, tricks. Okay, I've got stereo sound effects. Okay, I've got a high-res graphic routine that, you know, that you couldn't do, nobody did years ago, wasn't done. Those are nice little catches, but if it doesn't play right, just forget it. So, gameplay is, I think, number one issues you have to have. So if you want to do a game, you know, something that has good gameplay. And this is the reason why I talk about a lot of clone type games. It's because you're taking a, a variation of this game, the gameplay is good, and you build on it. Graphics. You really want your graphics as good as your platform can support. And, you know, so if it's a VIC-20, your graphics is going to be a lot different than, you know, uh, Atari ST, Amiga, or a 10 color computer. And so my tool set is I basically use tile maps and the stuff. Basically, I define a character that goes to the background, and I have a routine that takes a map that tells where those goes at. And so I put a lot of work in the tools to build this. Any questions along that area? Okay, I guess we're good on that. I'm going to get to the tough part. <laughs> and a lot of you are going to think out there programming the game is the tough part, but actually not. The tough part is keeping the motivation going to do the game anymore. Because one, you're not going to make enough money to say, I'm going to get rich on this. You're not going to get enough fame, <laughs> though, you know, within the community. It, it helps a little bit. So, uh, you know, staying motivated is the issue. And to do that, part of the thing is, you know, I drop hints on the, on the user groups, get people to say, oh, that looks cool. Okay. <coughs> that helps me keep going a little bit. I do charge a little bit. That motivates me a little bit. Nothing near the fraction amount of time for the, you put into it. You know, it just doesn't happen. The community is not that big. And uh, so... Uh, Keeping the excitement going in your mind. And uh, that's a big thing it's on, on, on that. You know, so if you look at a project, it's OK. It's a cool project. So what do I have that's going to motivate me to keep it going? I got some friend who's going to play test it for me. And give me some feedback. Oh, this is looking really cool. Uh, that helps. You know, it, it gets you psyched to go to that next step you know, to do it. Uh, I have a Dr. Mario clone. It's three quarters away from getting motivated to finish it. Has been the big issue, you know, because it plays. All the game plays in there, you know. Hey, I gotta work on the graphics, grunt work. So uh, motivation. So if you know anybody that's doing a project, help motivate them. You know, hey, it looks cool. Tell them it, it'll do that, and. You know, I know in the color computer community, we've got some things that's really helping for that. Uh, 
very active. We have a Coco Talk weekly talk. Uh, in fact, it's probably going on right now. Still, I turned Skype off so I wouldn't have messages keep jumping out on Skype with the talk. Uh, do it live talk. We have our podcast, and so on. So, if you're a gamer and you need motivated, get involved in the community enough so that people can give you some feedback. Secondly, always know there's always the doomsayers. Been there from day one. You know, um, why are you doing that? What sense does it make? Well, it's cool because you can. Why well, do you quite Mount Everest for a mountain climber? Because it's there. And so as a programmer and, a, and I don't know, I guess I could be called one of the leaders of the community. Am I that prominent? <laughs> one of the Coco community leaders? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, just because I've been there that long. <laughs> and so I, I actively try to get other people to do something. Oh, well, you're doing that. Go for it. Uh, I know Evan. I did some encouragement for Evan. Okay. And Evan released a game cartridge to the color computer this year. And good show. And so if you, you know, you can have two approaches. You can just play games that's out there that's been there for 30 years. Or you can encourage people who are playing with it. Okay. So that's kind of the hard part, the motivation. And for me, the graphic design, yeah, I've got some nice graphic design, but it's a lot of work for me. The coding comes a lot easier for, for me personally. Uh, while I've been the visual person as a photographer and stuff, the drawing skill set is not there. and It's had to been developed over the years. And uh, uh, 30 years ago, I probably couldn't have drawn that. <laughs> Just to be honest, okay? But uh, tools there. And uh, game development. Game development is, is very unique and can be, it can be tough. Because basically you're writing a multitasking operating system inside your system. Because you have to be able to go and and say, hey, this character's doing this, what we can do. And how complex that is depends on how complex your game is. You know, a simple game, it's very simple. But, uh, and you get to learn the hardware very well. You know, get talking to it and, and, and tricks. You know, I, I noticed, Evan, this is not a criticism, but you talked about in your game cartridge, you use a couple characters to the disc controller, would, ROM would be recognized. And it worked, but that's not the standard way of doing a, a game cartridge. Right. The demo, the so game. I, was, I had bad, somehow there was bad, had bad meme ROMs. And I, once uh, I had the right ROMs, I could get, got, went back and fixed that. But by the time I fixed it, I'd already given the talk and it was already there for a Right. And, but, but he found a way that worked, okay? And that's the, the key is sometimes it's not always you're finding the best way, you're finding the way you can find at the time that works and it works good enough and uh, I, I you know I don't show a lot of my code and stuff because hey, a lot of it's sloppy <laughs> I'm sorry you know it you know I'm not part of me says oh this is terrible I didn't tighten this loop here and I'm saying okay this loop doesn't really need to be tight here let me focus on the stuff where that this loop needs to be a recycle count you know, cut out of it. So, you know, you're sloppy in some areas because you can get by with it, and you're, you're doing your genius coding in this small little portion of the code because this is where it needs it at. You know, this is either good enough. If I'd make this code genius portion, all of it, nobody would ever see it because it'd take me too long. And I have a life, I have a day job, <laughs> I have a wife, uh, you know, and, and those things. So, you've got to balance all of these things. And to come with a product that uh, it looks really good to the end users, and, and they don't know the compromises that you made. And uh, gems too, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about taking this to a cartridge just because I'm doing cartridges now. 
And there's a few features I didn't put in this, but it actually has a lot of cool features. Complete undo, okay? Something you really didn't see in a 8-bit era game is be able to play through a puzzle and undo it all the way back to the start <laughs> and replay it. But you can do it in this, okay? And so it takes a lot of memory, <laughs> but hey, 5 k we've got it, we need the puzzle game, we can do it. You know, uh, so there's a lot of design decisions that go. Uh, I always try to make sure I have a, a play tester to work with me. Back in the day, it was my brother. He really loved to play games. He'd play the daylights out of it. So, you know, there was going to be a bug there. He's going to find it because he, and growl at me because I messed his game up. <laughs> okay, and so we have those things there. And and you know, I'm looking here, and this is probably not what you expect in the game programming talk. But it's probably very viable information if you're considering programming the game, because these are background things, things you do. And, and now, the other thing in this day and age, if you're going to do programming, you know, you're going to need to promote your game at some point in time. So, and I've done this for a number of years, and so I do like, the reason I don't have one of them on, you know, they said for the microphone, let's have a college shirt so you can have some place with the microphone. Okay, so accommodating our audio needs, I didn't, want, I didn't wear on my t-shirts for my games. But this is my Bomb Squad t-shirt. And so I always kind of have something related to that. Mouse pad, I did a poster. I you know, found a rescue truck and, and badge and everything that said something Bomb Squad and printed a poster out, took it to the show. It gives everything, you know, you're not selling just the game, you're selling the experience to the person. And that's the whole key to entertainment. You know, how many times you watch a movie and it's like great and something they, they blow the, the experience for you. You know, something just sticks out as you're a tech person, this is impossible, it didn't fit, or to ear a movie and it's not in the ear. <laughs> Happy days would drive me crazy because the microphones they were used with the foam wind covers, okay? Didn't exist that. <laughs> You know, and it's like, oh great, okay, they're missing it. And so you you create experience. Your, your gameplay is, you know, that's why your gameplay has to be good. You have to pull it in, because you can't do real. It won't handle it. But you got to be good enough. You suspend reality and buy into the illusion. Okay, and so you buy, get them to buy into your illusion of the game, through the gameplay, your graphics, and you become the entertainment piece, enough sound to make it to do what it wants to do. You know, so your balance in that depends on the games. Some games require more in the sound realm, and the music. Some you get by very little. And so you have to balance all these things together. And hopefully, by the time you've done it all, you've got something that's going to get, and the guy would play, oh, that's cool. And my cool moment was, we did, had Atlanta uh, Cocoa Fest, and Alan Huffman was one of the sysops on Delphi, and I was going to meet him at the show. And I'd never been to the Atlanta show before, and he had. So he's going to introduce me around to people. And so I go and meet up with Alan, and, and you know, so we have Block had just been published. And, and I'm walking around, and he said, he's talking to some guy. He said, hey, I got this guy. He said, some really cool stuff. I want you to meet him. And I'm looking, OK, I got somebody else new cool to meet I haven't met before. And suddenly it dawns on the wheel of on me, he's talking about me. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> And so this is kind of the motivating factor that keeps you going. I mean, you've got to learn your code, okay? You've got to learn your hardware, okay? But it's 30 years ago since these things have been made. <laughs> In the Cocoa community, we're very unique. We have two field programmer grade away projects that are very nice that emulate the co in hardware that are new Cocos. And, you know, 27 megahertz clock rate, okay? Compared to our, you know, our 
1.79 megahertz clock rate the color computer ran out. And, um, and they're doing some very nice things. They're not quite totally polished, finished yet, but they're getting closer. And uh, to me, it's likely they look like a development system. I cost platform development. I do run the final games and testing on the real hardware. Just time-wise, okay, one thing I don't miss is that 20-minute assembly time. <laughs> Okay, now I do currently use an emulator and run a era assembler on it because I can do the single dub, uh, step debugging if I run into something that's acting really crazy or in something in the past 30 years, I'm doing something that I knew better 30 years ago from doing and I'm doing some index mode, it's not what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm thinking in C instead of 6809 assembly and I've done that a couple times. And I look at it, oh, wait a minute. Why did I do that? Oh, that's how you do it in C. That's not how you do it in 6809. <laughs> We're doing something totally different here. And so you have those things. And so get you a set of tools. I know on Atari and Commodores and stuff, there's some uh, tile map editors out there designed to do that for Genesis. Uh, you know, find your set of tools. Make yourself work easier. And I know Nick Marantis uh, in Australia, who's one of the other guys who's, uh, it's been around for ages like me in the color computer community, it still does game. He prefers to do it all old school way, but he, he does use Omega, which back from the time to do his graphics, some of the sound work on. But he did that when he did a, you know, the color computer games too. But get you a tool set you're comfortable with. And, and learn your tool set inside and out so it doesn't become your restriction. Learn your instruction set, learn your hardware, get, make sure you got your references. And those are good things. And feel free to talk to people on ideas. And if people don't like your idea, and if you're really sold on it, go and do it for yourself. And uh, let me bring open another file here. Yeah, I should have another uh, tile set. Well, I did a bunch of changes uh, about like December in the tool set and I've got to work out some of the bugs that's still existing in my tool set. And so I had a tail map editor and I needed to do some sprites so I just added some of the things into the, to my uh, tail map editor rather than creating another whole new tool set. And it's complaining today. Okay. Let's make that load again and see if it fixes it. Thing about doing your own tools, you can't blame anybody else out yourself, but you have a bug. setting. Okay. There we go. 
But you, you've seen things flip through a little bit there. So I can preview this and, uh, and get an idea how these different sprites work together. Uh, transparency, I've got a sprite compiler. Um, what a compiled sprite is, you have a couple ways to do on the any com color computer, your, your screen is bitmapped. You don't have any player missiles or sprites as building the hardware that you have in some other systems. So you have to do this in, all in software. And so you, you can keep a copy of the data and then write a routine that copies that over the screen and do whatever you need to do, background transparency. Or you can actually code that straight into the code. If it's straight in the code, it's what we call a compiled sprite. And so the advantage of the compiled sprite is it's much faster in the routine that's generic and loops over data and writes it to the screen. The disadvantage is it's a lot larger size and code size. So you can make the program a lot, a lot faster. So you, again, you have a trade-off of what do we need to do is fast, but slow, et cetera. And And uh, you know this one is going to hand some unique challenges yet because the, the sprite characters are actually fairly big uh, compared to what we have, so we're moving a lot of data around with that. And um, so I noticed that he's got what, is it black eyes and a black background. So does the, the black if the black indicates transparent? Does that mean like you will have hollow eyes on the screen? Well. The black here uh, may not have transparency in that issue. If you here, we're not seeing all the the things. If you look on my other screen, you see I've got here. These are actually the the transparent items. Okay, and so with this tool, I can do a full 16 colors on a 16 color set and still have my transparency. Okay because I'm not reserving any particular color set for that. But oftentimes you will reserve, it's simpler to reserve just a, a single color for the transparency and check for that. And uh, which is the easiest way to do if you're not doing a compiled because you have one, one value to check against. Zero value is a very convenient one to check against. And so there's multiple ways to do things. But in this case, I have a, uh, a channel just set for the transparency for it. And we do, yeah. And so some of these I have it set on and some of them. But it's the tools, the idea is, you know, to do a good video game anymore, they do a, a big team of people. And getting a team of people to do a game together now is there. In fact, I have somebody who's supposed to be writing me music for things, and he got busy this summer. So <laughs> no music to work with yet. And so, you know, do not be afraid to write something basic or whatever you want to do. PC to help you create what you want to do and just let your creative ideas go. Do something that nobody else has done, okay? You know, fix it for you. Okay, it's my target. Nobody's done that on the 8 bit machine. And we'll do, I think I'm going to do it. It's going to be cool. And uh, hoping to do it in a game cartridge. I'm going to add a, on chip, a sound chip on the cartridge. So that's something pretty cool for the next Coco Fest is my goal. And uh, I've still got some cool ideas up my, my sleeve, so to speak. <laughs> uh, working on a game idea, which I don't think has been done on any 8-bit machine, but very doable on an 8-bit machine. And uh, so it, 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 it's interesting. Uh, feedback from people always helps. Uh, any game development questions? I know I didn't get down to the nitty gritty and the stuff that people might have expected. Do you do everything in, in 
an assembly, or do you do a mixture of C and assembly? No C on the Cocoa. Is it just that the, the function calls have too much overhead, or lack of a good compiler? Or? Compiler situations has gotten better. They've got CMOC. Uh, if you do an OS 9, the C compiler wasn't that bad there. You have a lot of overhead. The when um, I go to go have to get some background for the rest of people that aren't at Coco. Uh, on the color computer, you had the disk basic operating system, okay, which built in the basic. And then the big one that was other than that was OS 9 was a real time operating system. Very nice system, uh, and they had a graphic user interface, but they actually wrote that interface in C. And in C, your code size is about 10 si times the, the, what I could do in assembly. I wrote some OS 9 utilities in assembly, and I was about one-tenth the size of what we were getting out of C at the time in, in there. So you're, you got a major factor of code size space because overhead function calls and things like that. And then you had the th speed penalty because, hey, they're doing something this way each time. If you do an assembly, you know what it is, what's in the registers, what you have to save and what you don't have to save. So you, you do a minimal movement except when necessary. The bad side of that, game logic, especially in some of the puzzle games I've done, can be a bear to do an assembly, to keep track of everything and not do anything. It would be much easier in C. And I probably could have done if we had a sufficient compiler or something at the time, some of the puzzle games would, would have worked with that. Tetris, you could probably do Tetris in C with some in assembly language calling and, and be fine. Because I was playing, I had a playable game in basic, but just wasn't fast enough to make it smooth and stuff to do that. So you probably could have done Tetris and C. So depending on what, what you're doing, uh, level head, uh, at the level what you're doing. I know uh, Rick Adams was doing the overhead stuff in his attempt at last Lint Ninja and C and doing low level stuff in assembly. Uh, again, because depending on what's being handled at the high level, C can handle high level stuff but uh, low-level stuff on an 8-bit machine, you're writing the screen because uh, you're really moving a lot of data around. Because on a color computer 3, the standard 16-color high-res screen for us, you're moving approximately 32K of memory, okay? On an 8-bit machine, running a max of 1.79 megahertz. And on the Coco, to do that, a lot of time I'm using what's called a stack blast. And that's you pushing a bunch of stuff to the stack, which a single command can do. And we, since we have a, a couple stack registers, we pull from the stack at one location, which is in our code location, pushing back the stack location, which is pointing to the screen. And so one instruction can move uh, a bunch of memory at once. And then if you use a 6309, which is a, a variation on the, the 6809, it has a, a transfer of instruction that's even faster. So at low level stuff, getting things on the screen so you don't get your flicker, and getting it fast enough to make it playable, you're going to have to do assembly language. Now, if you're doing a puzzle game, if it's a slow puzzle, my puzzle games are kind of a combination arcade puzzle because there is action happening with the, the thing. Uh, Gems a little different too. Gems too probably could do, you know, high level stuff. Maybe get by except for when flashing the screen and selecting the area. So a lot of that probably could have been done and see if we had a, you know, a sufficient compiler that would do that. And we're getting some things better. Some people are working on those things. Any projects out there? Anybody actually doing anything? OK. Evan's doing stuff. He's had his own talk on that. So. Oh, yeah. So that, that, that's been going in waves. So, and it's very, to, so getting to the point of how to keep up motivation, like I find the fests the and the, to be extremely 
motivational. So last Coco Fest, it was, okay, I've got to get, you know, maybe I can get this thing up, up, up to the point where I can demo it for Coco Fest. It turned out, oh yeah, I can. Okay, well maybe I can do the TRS-80 part before Coco Fest too. And I just about pulled that off. And then there was Kansas Fest over the summer. So it's like, okay, maybe I'll get it to do Apple II uh, over the summer. So the, the, the test, the, the fest become my targets. Uh, so after this, I'm gonna, you know, we've got the Tandy Assembly coming up, so now it's gonna be back to, back to Coco, back to TRS-80 to get everything polished up for that. Yeah. It comes to mind in a movie, old movie I like that James Garner, it's like support your local sh sheriff, <laughs> okay? And support your local programmer, game programmer, okay? And people that would do that. And, and if you have a skill that can help someone, you know, offer, but if you offer, you know, make sure you, you know, follow through with him because it, you know, it's gonna help keep him motivated. And I think there's things on different platforms that'd be cool that is on other platforms, you know. Um, yeah, I've got an idea that's, I got a TurboGrafx game that somebody wants, says I should port. Okay, and I may do that. And I'm gonna make a kind of a, uh, I'm gonna say clone. Uh, things that's happening in the color computer, some things are very exciting in game development right now. Uh, we got a transcode, which I, I will say would be uh, a port He's basically, basically translated the Z80 code to 6809 and then had to rewrite some of the uh, graphic stuff for it. And um, we've had a couple things on, done similar to that. Pac-Man, okay, just recently done. Um, Donkey Kong, probably, we probably have the best playing Donkey Kong on any system now on the Tandy Color computer. But that's because a guy who worked commercially in game programming, John Kowatsky, decided to port it to the color computer. And code by code, so it plays exactly like the original did. And so a lot of interest going on that. We're getting, uh, Mark from Australia is doing uh, translations from the original assembly, you know, source code. They disassemble the code and work from that and recreate another game. And so those I want to I want to call port. I call what I do maybe a clone. You know, I never see the original code. I look at it, I play it, and I write all my code original without based on it. And uh, and sometimes I give a different twist. My uh, so it blocks a little bit wider, makes it more of a puzzle game, and then a fast twitch arcade game. And that was done on purpose. I get I've spilled most of my time and uh, any questions or comments it's open and if no comments we're through thank you very much for putting up with me <laughs> and uh, hopefully you know you've got some ideas if you about programming that you didn't have before and uh, with a mixed group crowd of different platforms, really can't go in coding tricks and stuff because they don't all apply across the, across the board. Again, thank you. <laughs>